So in this second section of chapter five, we're going to talk a little bit about viral nucleic acids and actually using those to create new viruses. Now, I've mentioned previously that viruses, when it comes to their genome, have DNA or RNA, but never both. And a lot of this comes from the fact that the viruses themselves do not have the machinery to turn DNA into RNA or the machinery to turn RNA into proteins. All of that machinery is going to be found within the host cell. So they're hijacking the host cell to basically do all of the work that the virus themselves can't. This is why viral replication depends upon a host cell. And one of the reasons why I continue to call them host cell hijackers. They're going to hijack the cell and force it to do what the virus wants done, which is always replication, making new viruses. Now, the number of genes that you can find in a viral genome is usually very small in comparison to a cell's genome. Uh, for example, four genes in a hepatitis B virus, hundreds of genes in some of the herpes viruses. The reason behind this is that viruses are only going to possess the genes they need to actually invade the host cell and successfully have that host cell make new viruses. So they're only bringing in the genes to get into the host cell and redirect the host cell's activity towards viral activity. Now, <clears throat> another thing that's going to be really different is that viruses are going to exhibit a really wide variety of DNA or RNA. It's not going to be the same as what you see in a cell, right? at least not always. Uh, DNA viruses can come with single-stranded DNA, that's unusual for us, uh, or double-stranded DNA. The DNA can be linear or it can come in circular segments. RNA viruses possess no DNA, but they can have double-stranded RNA. Much more commonly, we see single-stranded RNA, which comes in two varieties. Positive sense RNA, which is ready for translation. In other words, this is basically mRNA. Right? Or negative sense single-stranded RNA that has to be converted before translation can occur. This is, in essence, the complement okay, to the mRNA. In other words, this is the other strand. Okay? So a positive sense strand, the other side of it to make a double sense, okay, to make a double strand of RNA would be the negative sense strand. And when it comes to a negative sense strand of RNA, the complementary other side of this, if you were making double stranded RNA, would be positive sense RNA. Okay? Uh, RNA is usually segmented, coming in several pieces. Uh, it can, however, be linear, but oftentimes it is segmented. And a sort of odd class of the RNA viruses, the retroviruses. Okay? Uh, these guys actually work backwards okay, and bring with them an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, okay, which they will use to actually convert RNA to... DNA. In other words, they're going to do transcription in reverse, hence reverse transcriptase. More on this to come a little bit later. Now, <clears throat> other things you can find inside of a virus, enzymes. Uh, usually these are going to be enzymes that perform very specific functions within the cell, and the enzymes that viruses bring with them are usually things that they need but the cell won't provide. I always tell people this is kind of like being a vegetarian at a picnic. If you want a veggie burger, chances are you're going to have to bring it yourself. You know, if you're if you're coming to the barbecue and you want something specific, you're going to have to bring it with you. So the viruses that invade the host cells, if they need specific enzymes to replicate, and it's something specific to a virus, well, our cells aren't going to have that. So a host cell isn't going to provide a virus with how to replicate a virus machinery. So host cells won't have this information, viruses must bring it with them. Uh, we'll see some odd polymerases able to synthesize DNA or RNA. Uh, replicases that will actually copy RNA, so they do RNA to RNA copying. Uh, this can be going from positive sense strands to negative sense strands or vice versa. Okay? And even reverse transcriptase. This isn't something that's normal within our bodies. Okay? So viruses that need reverse transcriptase, specifically the retroviruses, will have to bring it with them. Okay? 
They're not going to have any enzymes for metabolic functions. Viruses do not metabolize, if you remember that from the first lecture. Some viruses will actually borrow things from the host cell that they've hijacked, so they'll grab a couple of enzymes, uh, things like tRNAs or possibly some polymerases to carry with them into the next cell, basically picking up things they could think might be useful along the way. Okay. So basically equipment to hijack another cell is more like it. So viral replication is up next. Remember, these are minute parasites that are going to control the set of synthetic and genetic machinery of cells. They're going to get in and take over completely. They're not going to allow the cell to continue normal cell functions. They're going to turn the cell into a viral factory. Okay. Now, the reason we talk about this is because how viruses replicate actually dictates the way viruses get transmitted, so how we move them from person to person, what the virus actually does to the host, so how you get sick or why you get sick, how your immune system responds, okay, and how we attempt to treat viral infections. In fact, at the end of this, we're going to steal a little bit from later chapters and talk about antivirals while we're speaking uh, of viral replication because the two go hand in hand. So, first up, we are actually going to talk about two different replication cycles, animal virus replication, and then later we're going to talk about bacteriophage replication, which is very, very similar. Uh, so animal viruses, we're talking about viruses that could infect us. The replication cycle here happens in six major steps. Okay. Uh, lucky for us, be very honest, the steps are pretty much exactly what they sound like. Uh, adsorption. Uh, which is sometimes also referred to as attachment. Remember those viral spikes we were talking about? They're going to play a role here. Now, penetration, or getting into the cell. Uncoating, where we remove the coatings from the virus. Synthesis, where we're going to assemble several pieces together, okay, or assemble individual components of the virus. And then assembly, where we put those pieces together. I'm sorry, I kind of misspoke for four. Synthesis, where assembling the components of the virus, so we're making all of the pieces, and then assembly, we're putting all those pieces together, and then once all the pieces are together, the virus is going to be released to go and hopefully, from the virus's standpoint, uh, restart the infection cycle in another cell. Now, how long the replica replication cycle takes depends upon the virus. Okay? Um, it can be eight hours in a relatively fast virus, like a polio virus, all the way up to 36 hours in a herpes virus. This one's considered mm, relatively slow. Okay. Now, <clears throat> how long it takes, a lot of this is going to depend upon how much stuff there is to do, how complex the virus is. Relatively simple viruses are going to take less time. Uh, more complex viruses with more components and more pieces and possibly even more enzymes are going to take more time. One thing I want you to remember as we're going through this is that replication for viruses is not going to be like binary fission is for bacteria. When we talk about replication cycles going from one step to the next step, okay, or going from one to six and then going all the way back around again, uh, we're not going from one bacteria to two. Okay? Instead, we're talking about having possibly hundreds uh, or even close to a few thousand viruses actually escape from one cell at a time. Okay? So that eight hours could be 10 to 100 viruses escaping from one cell and infecting 10 to 100 new cells, depending upon the virus. Okay. So <clears throat> adsorption, actually attaching to the host. So we're going to remember this adsorption. Okay? We've got to grab on to that host cell. Okay? Viruses only invade host cells through making an exact fit with specific host molecules. In other words, they have got to fit onto host cell receptors. Okay. This dictates what we call the host range of a virus. Uh, it's a limited range of cells that a virus can infect, and it really depends upon the virus itself. Uh, hepatitis B specifically goes for liver cells and humans. Okay. So humans is our host range here. Polio virus, intestinal nerve cells of primates. So we expanded with the polio virus out to primates. Rabies, lots of different cell types, and all in mammals. So this one has an even larger host range. So this is a small host range only in humans. 
this is a pretty large host range. There are a lot of different types of mammals out there. Okay? So because we're all about that cell specificity when it comes to the host range, okay, cells that lack compatible receptors are automatically resistant to that particular virus. Now another thing mentioned in here are what we call viral tropisms. When it comes to a viral tropism, okay, we're saying a specific type of tissue is being attacked. Okay? So liver cells are the tropism for hepatitis B, intestinal and nerve cells for the polio virus, and then these various types of cells when it comes to rabies. Okay? So host range is about the host, tropisms are about the tissue type specificity. Now, penetration and encoding are mentioned together because nine times out of ten, they usually happen at the same time. Uh, the flexible cell membrane of the host gets penetrated by the whole virus or by the viral nucleic acid, but either way, what we're saying here is the virus is getting in. Okay? Penetration usually happens through endocytosis, so after attachment and after that virus has docked with the host cell, it is endocytosed okay, into the host cell itself. Okay? So we're docking and then getting brought in by the host cell. Usually this is kind of a way that the virus has fooled the host cell into thinking that it's something it wants to bring inside. Okay? Now when it comes to uncoding, okay, big goal here, get those nucleic acids out of the virus. We need the DNA or the RNA to be out in the cytoplasm of the host cell so that it can be used. Okay? So once the host cell is actually brought the virus in. You can see it here. Okay? So once the host cell has brought that virus in, we're going to actually see enzymes begin to break down the membrane and the capsid okay, of the virus and then we'll release the DNA out into the host cell. Okay? So the fusion of the virus with the membrane okay, and or the membrane being broken down afterwards, so this host cell envelope and host cell capsid being broken down afterwards, uncoat the virus and allow the free DNA or RNA to actually move okay, into the host cell. Now there again there are some videos on the of this okay. check connect. Okay. It's gonna be your best friend. We're gonna show you these little spikes actually attached to receptors in the host cell and bring the entire virus in. Now, the next step is synthesis, where we're doing replication and protein production. So we're going to take that viral genetic material okay, and replicate it to put it into new viruses. So DNA viruses are going to have to make more DNA to put into new viruses. RNA viruses are going to have to make more RNA to put into new viruses. Both DNA and RNA viruses are going to eventually have to make proteins because that's what capsids are made of. And remember, we're going to put all those little individual capsomere proteins together to make a capsid. Okay? So, we can see it here. If you're dealing with a positive stranded RNA virus, the nice part about this is that this is basically mRNA. Okay? So it can be turned into proteins. Great, you got your proteins out. We're going to need new positive sense RNA. Okay? The way to do this is to use the positive sense RNA to make negative sense RNA. And now this becomes a template for the production of new positive sense RNA. Okay. Negative sense RNA will be done the same way. The negative will be turned into a positive sense. Right. Remember these are opposite strands, so A's and U's and C's and G's going together. Right. The positive sense is how we make new negative sense, and the positive sense will let us make proteins because positive sense RNA is basically mRNA. Okay? So we got our new genome, new proteins. Double stranded RNA will do something very similar. We'll make a single strand, basically separate these two, use one as a template to make a new strand of RNA, okay? new double stranded RNA specifically and a positive sense strand as a template to make proteins. Okay. Retroviruses, RNA will be turned into a strand of DNA. That DNA will be duplicated to make double stranded DNA, or we can make new RNA and new proteins. Okay. 
The DNA viruses, well, it depends on which type of DNA you get. If you're dealing with a double-stranded DNA virus, well, our cells know exactly what to do with that. We absolutely know how to turn double-stranded DNA into more double-stranded DNA. Our cells also know how to turn double-stranded DNA into mRNA to make proteins. Okay? So this one's going to be the most similar to what the cell is comfortable with. Okay? Single-stranded RNA is also going to be pretty similar. Uh, our cells see single-stranded RNA, oh, we, we must have forgotten. We're supposed to be duplicating this. Single-stranded DNA is supposed to be turned into double-stranded DNA. So that single-stranded DNA gets turned into double-stranded DNA. Okay. It's used to make mRNA, which is used to make proteins. And then <clears throat> this double-stranded DNA is separated back apart. Okay. We now have a single-stranded protein or a single-stranded uh, of DNA and a protein to go with it. Okay. So it depends on what your template is. Positive will be used to make negative and proteins. Negative will you be used to make positive, and then the positive will be used to make proteins when you're dealing with the RNA. Okay. And when it comes to the DNA, it depends do you get double-stranded or single-stranded. Either way, the goal is eventually make double-stranded because our cells know what to do with that. You can see it here. I've actually thrown another uh, visual of this into your notes. Okay. So you have the visual to go along with your notes. So assembly. We're actually putting together the viral components here. All of those pieces, those proteins that got made, basically the capsomeres, uh, and the nucleic acid get joined together. Uh, to make that nucleocapsid that we were talking about. So DNA or RNA inside of a capsid. Okay. And then the last, uh, release. Okay. Now, the number of viruses that gets released from an infected cell really varies. Okay. It depends upon the size of the virus, the size of the host cell, the health of the host cell. Um, obviously, bigger cells are going to hold more viruses, smaller cells will hold less. Um, pox virus infected cells uh, will hold anywhere from three to 4,000 virions. Uh, polio virus infected cells, polio virus is extremely tiny, 100,000 virions in a polio cell. So no matter what, even one cell being infected leads to the potential for extreme amounts of proliferation. In other words, you're going to get lots of viruses moving into a lot of new cells very, very quickly. What we see from this are what we call cytopathic effects. This is the damage that we can actually visualize underneath the microscope. Okay. The cytopathic effects, uh, we can't see. Now remember this, we're not seeing these viruses underneath a normal microscope, but we could actually see the damage the virus causes to the cells underneath the microscope. So changes in shape and size of the cell so massive amounts of change in shape and size of a cell is an indicator for viral infection uh, intracellular changes basically what we usually see here when it comes to the intracellular changes are things like inclusion bodies um, masses of viruses inside of a cell so groups of viruses inside of the cell uh, damaged cell organelles in the, in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm uh, mainly because the virus doesn't need the organelles anymore Okay. Virus doesn't need a no plasma particulum or Golgi body. Okay. The virus is ready to get rid of those. Honestly, most viruses will chop these up for pieces. Or actually just shove them to one side, uh, leave them there. Okay. Kind of like a nice big chop shop for viruses. Okay. So we'll leave them all there and you end up seeing these sort of bunches of viruses shoved over to the side of the cell. Uh, another thing you might see are what we call syncytia, where multiple cells actually fuse together to form a gigantic cell with multiple nuclei. So if this okay, is what we consider a normal cell. We look over here okay, and we see this gigantic syncytial cell with lots of nuclei on the inside. The goal here, pack up as many cells uh, sort of join them together as many as humanly possible, basically making a giant virus factory. Okay. So this is what's known as syncytia. Now, 
as the damage from viruses accumulates, to be very honest, the infection itself kills the majority of cells. Okay? There are several different types of viral infections. In a persistent infection, host cells might harbor the virus for extended periods of time. Uh, usually, if a virus is being harbored for an extended period of time, uh, it's harbored as what we call a provirus. A provirus happens when the viral DNA actually gets incorporated into the DNA of the host. In other words, the viral DNA gets put into your cell's chromosomes. Okay. Now, this is dangerous because what that means is your cells are walking around with little how to make a virus instructions all the time. Uh, lots of times we see this referred to as a chronic latent state. That dormant period uh, for the viruses uh, leads to humans having a chronic latent state. Probably the best examples of these are herpes viruses where they lie dormant for extended periods of time. Uh, usually what we see with this is that later under periods of stress, usually when someone is immunocompromised or there's what we call decreased immunosurveillance, in other words your immune system is busy doing something else, the virus reactivates and causes a new infection. Okay? Uh, cold sores, general herpes with herpes simplex viruses, um, herpes zoster virus which causes chicken pox, shingles is the alternative example of this. You can have the chicken pox when you're five and have the shingles when you're 75. What's happened is the organism has been dormant within the basal ganglia in the back of the spine. Okay? Uh, so on your back where your spinal cord is, those basal ganglia will actually hold on to the DNA for how to make those viruses. And then as you age, you automatically become immunocompromised. Uh, some people get sunburned or stressed or sick and become immunocompromised. And what we see is reactivation of the viruses leading to a new infection. Now, you can't leave this without talking about the link between viruses and cancer. Uh, we do know that there is one. Uh, experts estimate that up to 20% of human cancers are caused or have something to do with viral infection. Now, with that being said, it depends upon the experts you talk to because there are some people out there that are saying the number is more like 50%. Uh, you can get really crazy and there are some experts that say 80%. Uh, we know for a fact it's about 20%. What happens here is that the viruses actually cause transformation of the cells. Okay? So transformation is what happens when cells are affected by oncogenic viruses. So cancer causing viruses are oncogenic viruses. Uh, those viruses actually increase the growth rate of the cell and cause changes in the chromosomes. Those changes in the chromosomes mean there are changes in the DNA. Uh, this changes the cell surface molecules, causes cells not to stick to one another the way they're supposed to, uh, gives cells the capacity to divide for infinite periods of time, mainly because they decrease the cell's capacity to regulate going through the cell cycle. If you remember the cell cycle, uh, G1, S, G2, and mitosis, uh, this is basically the cycle of cell growth, and there are checkpoints during the cell cycle that provide the cell with information to be assured that the cell is multiplying correctly, that the cell is growing and multiplying the way it should. Now, viruses that affect the DNA can affect those proteins that are responsible for those checkpoints, basically making it impossible for the cell to ensure that all of its replication is done correctly. This leads to increased replication and basically decreased fidelity of replication. In other words, the replication is not going to be as exact as it was before, which leads to even more problems than the problems expand and expand and expand. Okay. So cancer, your definition is dysregulation of the cell cycle. Okay. And viruses cause this by basically disrupting and changing the DNA so that the cell cycle is no longer policed by its checkpoints. Now, <clears throat> the other part of this I want to mention is the 
replication cycle of bacteriophages. Okay. Now, if you remember, I mentioned previously that a bacteriophage, let me get to a white screen here, that this little guy when you saw him was a bacteriophage. So these did not infect humans. Okay. Well, that's true. Okay. So, what we see is that these bacteriophages absolutely infect bacterial cells. Okay. Nice little bacillus. Okay. And okay. that these little legs, these little spider legs, it's always what people think they look like, are actually modified spikes. Okay. They're going to be responsible for helping the bacteriophage attach itself to the bacteria. Okay. Now, once the bacteriophage is attached to the bacteria, what you'll see happen is that it will actually puncture okay, the cell membrane and the cell wall of the bacteria. Okay. Now, when that happens, the DNA itself is going to be basically injected okay, into the bacteria. Okay. Now, I will be the first to admit that bacteriophage replication is almost exactly like animal virus replication, but instead of having six steps, there are only going to be five. So what we're going to do here is cut out a step altogether. Can anybody think of which step we're going to cut? Okay. Well, we're definitely going to do adsorption. Remember, the spikes are attaching to the outside. Okay. We're going to do penetration. Okay. Because this uh, little tail fiber is what it's called, okay. right here, that injects itself into the DNA is penetrate or injects the DNA into the bacteria is actually penetrating the bacteria. Are we going to do the uncoating step? No. There's nothing to uncoat. The DNA itself got directly into the bacteria. Okay? So the virus itself wasn't endocytosed. It wasn't brought in to the bacteria. Instead, the information on how to make a new virus is injected straight in. So we cut out the uncoating step. Now, once that DNA is on the inside, okay, sorry about that. Once that DNA is on the inside, we're going to do synthesis, okay, then assembly, and release. Okay. So, five steps here instead of six. You can see it here, adsorption, where the nice little bacteriophages sort of attach themselves to the bacterial cell itself. Okay? Penetration with our injection of the DNA. Okay? Uh, duplication of the component, so this is what we're referring to as assembly. Okay? Those components are being put together in both of these. Okay? Um, assembly and maturation go hand in hand here. We're just going to call them both assembly. And then the virus itself is going to weaken right, the cell wall and the cell membrane of the bacteria. And eventually all these new virions will be leached out and they will all go to find a brand new bacteria to attack. So that is bacteriophage replication. Okay. Now, the end result here, we can see what's called a lytic cycle or a lysogenic cycle. Okay. The lytic cycle is the one you just saw. In a lytic infection, the host cell fills up with viruses and then ruptures. The end result is death of the cell. In a lysogenic infection, though, um, these are also called latent infections, or sometimes they're called temperate infections because they're not as violent okay, 
as lytic infections, uh, the viral genome actually becomes incorporated into the host cell's DNA. This was very similar to uh, herpes viruses and the provirus, but this time we're talking about bacteriophages. Okay? Uh, it can remain this way for an extended period of time and the host cell lives. Okay? And every time that host cell replicates, it's going to replicate a new cell that has a copy of that how to make a virus information in it. Now, this is one way that viruses can actually contribute to bacteria getting new information. Okay? We call this lysogenic conversion. Okay? So that virus, viruses can come into bacteria and actually just kind of donate new DNA to the bacteria. Okay? And then those bacteria go on and make new bacteria and are never actually killed by the virus itself. Uh, we do know for a fact that there are several bacteria that have picked up information like this. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All right. I said it earlier. Okay. Occasionally those phage genes enter into the bacterial chromosome and cause production of a virulence factor. Usually it's toxins or enzymes. Uh, that are actually dangerous to us. That lysogenic conversion, okay, where the bacteria gets a new trait from a temperate phage. Uh, we've seen it in diphtheria with diphtheria toxin. Cholera toxin actually came from a virus. Uh, botulinum toxin and clostridium botulinum. These were brought in by viruses. Isn't this scary? So now what, you're, now what we're getting to is that you're being infected by a bacteria that was at one point in time infected by a virus and had viral DNA transferred to the bacteria. Okay. So I'm going to end here and make the last little section um, a very, very brief video where we talk about other acellular infectious agents and antiviral drugs.